the story of Gideon is what we're going to look at today. And I know many of you have went over and over it, but I want to look at it from a little different standpoint, uh, from the standpoint of the troubles, the trials in our lives are actually what God uses to push us, to prepare us, to make us ready for where we need to go. We have been created from the foundation of the universe. Before we were in our mother's womb, Father knew us, right? And that's the thing that, in that vein, we've we've been pre-charged with a mission. So let's go ahead and open with prayer, and we'll get right into today's teaching. Father, I thank you and praise you for everything that you've given. I praise you for the anointing. I praise you for my brothers and sisters, for all those who are here, who are faithful, who want to grow and learn and be disciples. And I thank you for it. Thank you, Father, for everything that you have poured out to bless us. And Father, forgive us for all the sins, known and unknown, that we have committed against you and your holy covenant, your holy word. Father, I thank you for your forgiveness, for your healing, for your miraculous response to your word being read. And Father, we thank you right now for everything that you have done and everything that you're about to do. In Yeshua's name, amen. How God uses of adversity to move us to our calling. And some of you are going to say, well, I'll tell you what, I must be doing pretty good because I've had my fill of adversity. And you know what? I know some of us have had a lot more. And bless you, if you're one of those people that, uh, and I know a few of you listening have had a pretty rough, <clears throat> pretty rough go. But God is preparing something. He's going to use that. Okay? All things happen to good for them who love the Lord, who are called according to his purpose. That's from one end of the book to the other. Now, in Judges, we're going to look here at Gideon a little bit. I want to pull some things out of this as we go through, because Gideon is a great example. And for most of us, he's a lot like each and every one of us. Judges 6, 1 through 6, and the children of Israel, this is going to kind of set the story. And the children of Israel brought anarchy. They brought the opposite of shalom. In this particular, this is the One New Man Bible translation that I went ahead and copied these out of. But there, uh, they had a footnote on anarchy. The, the word there, opposite of shalom, is ra. Isn't it funny when you think about that? Uh, some of the Egyptian gods... Akmun Ra and, and Ra being the sun guy. There's opposite of Shalom, basically. Anarchy in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian for seven years. Here we're going to look at Midian and Gideon. It kind of rhymes. And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel because of Midian, the children of Israel made for themselves dens, which are in the mountains and the caves and strongholds. Wait a minute. I thought this was their promised land. They moved in. They conquered it. They dispelled everybody else. But something happened, didn't it? They were still in the promised land, but they weren't living the promise anymore. What happened? And so it was, verse 3, when Israel had sown that the Midians came up and the Amalekites and the children of the east, and even they come up against them, and they camped against them and destroyed the increase of the earth until you come to Gaza and left no food for Israel. 
neither sheep nor ox nor donkey. They were like locusts. They just wiped the place out. For they came up with their cattle and their tents, and they came as grasshoppers for multitude. Both they and their camels were without number, and they entered the land to destroy it. And Israel was greatly impoverished because of Midian, and the children of Israel cried to the Lord. Isn't it sad that we have to get to this place? And it happens over and over again as you go through uh, what people know as the Old Testament. We know it as the Torah, the writings, the Tanakh, if you will that in the narrative, in the history of Israel, that was put in there for our education, that we see over and over again, Israel does good, the Lord delights in them, they live in peace and prosperity, and then they start to tank. And then things go sideways. And then they are taken over, or taken away, they come back to their senses and they cry out to the Lord and the, the whole thing starts all over again. How many times? And you can see it today. You can see it today in, in the church, in God's people. And this is going to play out again. You look at it. Country by country, there's going to be different countries that this same scenario will happen again. I'm not going to say who. I'm sure a few of you are thinking, hmm, I could take a good guess, but it's going to happen again. Judges 6 through 6, 6 through 10. And it was when the when the children actually 7 through 10, when the children of Israel cried to the Lord because of Midian. God uses adversity to get you to a position to seek him. Remember one of the first things he said in Deuteronomy, he said, remember when you go into this land of promise that you don't forget that it was I that gave it to you. It wasn't your might, it wasn't your strength, it wasn't your power, it wasn't because you were so special. It is by my hand and by my favor, because I loved you and I promised your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that you will go into this land. <clears throat> but if you forget, here's what's going to happen. And it played out exactly as the Lord God said over and over and over again. This also plays out in our personal lives. We get going good. We get a little loose. And then we wonder why we're on our back looking up out of a pit going, how in the world did I get here? Yeah, that's what happens. Now, uh, verse 8, the Lord sent a prophet to the children of Israel who said to them, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I am, did bring you up from Egypt and brought you out of the house of bondage and delivered you out of the hand of Egypt and out of the hand of all that put, all who oppressed you and drove them out before you and gave you their land. They they were they were squatters had squatters rights basically it was never really their land. But in Egypt when Israel had to move off and then go through again why you know you wonder the old patriarch was where he was supposed to be it was where Abraham was told to go, but then a famine came, and he was taken to Egypt. And there from Egypt, 400 years, and then back to the promised land. 
So these people that came in there were actually squatters that came in in that 400-year period into the land that was already given to Abraham. Did you ever consider that? God didn't do something new. He just brought them back to where it was. It all goes back to the covenant cut by Abraham and God, the two of them together. Now, verse 10, And I say to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not be in awe of the gods of the Amorite, in whose land you dwell, but you have not obeyed my voice. Ah, maybe they were watching the the uh, horoscopes in the Sunday newspaper that came out. Maybe they were listening to, uh, well, you know, the, we can't just tell them to stop everything. We've got to be tolerant, right? Well, you can love somebody but not tolerate the sin. Not tolerate, you've got to make a choice. You want to be friends with the world or friends with the creator of the world. That's the real option. That's the only choice you have. And an angel came of the Lord and sat under an oak, which was in Aphra. Isn't that nice? He just kind of came in, plunked down and said, I'll wait here for, for Gideon. that belonged to Joash, the Abyssalite, and his son Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress to hide it from the Midians. He was going out, found a neat little corner, was threshing out some wheat so he could make a loaf of bread or whatever, found a little bit, it was probably wild wheat, wild barley, whatever it was, and he found it and was trying to squirrel it away. But he can't hide from God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, mighty man of valor. Now, you wouldn't think a mighty man of valor would be hiding from his enemies. He wouldn't be doing what he is. He's calling Gideon by the man that he was created to be. You see, I made that statement before that we are called for a mission, for a purpose. We were made, we were sent, already encoded inside each and every one of us. You're no different than Gideon. I'm no different than Gideon. His story is our story. We've been called for a purpose. The problem is our identity yeah, think about that one. Lie identity, not identity. All the lies that that we've been taught. I'm too old. I'm too out of shape. I'm too poor. Uh, I'm not smart. Uh, I'll never get ahead. I come from the wrong family. I come from the wrong country. You name it. What identity do you have? Or do you see yourself the way God created you, the way he sees you? He didn't see Gideon, the coward, hiding behind the wheat, the, the, the wine press, trying to squirrel away some wheat. No, he saw the mighty man of valor that he was created from the foundation of the universe to be. I kind of belabored that a little bit, but I want it to sink in. The good news is you and I have that same thing going on in our lives. Who can we impact? Judges 6, 13, And Gideon said to him, Oh, my Lord, if, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this befallen us? How many people 
ask that after a natural disaster. What? How can the Lord let this happen? If he is so much love and goodness, how is it that people are destroyed in a tornado or a hurricane or a tsunami or an earthquake or whatever it is? Why are so many innocent people? Why has this all befallen us? Gideon was blind to the fact of what was going on. He was blinded to the fact. How many in the church today woe and cry? Why has the Lord seemed to have left us? And where are all those miracles which our fathers told us about? You know, even to the point where the church is teaching, you know, those miracles, all those things you read in the Bible, they're great stories. They're wonderful stories, but they're just stories. Miracles don't happen today. That was for them. That was for the apostles. That was for Yeshua. Because after all, he's the son of God and, and he can do all these things. Yet, didn't Yeshua say these things and greater shall you do because I go to my father? Yeah, I'm dipping into Prophet Darren's teaching this morning. Where are the miracles? I'm telling you, the miracles are still here. The miracles happen. But we don't expect them. That's the lie from the enemy. Some of us, some of us are just bold enough, just forward enough to say, God, if you're God, guess what? Prove it. I know you can. I know it's your will to do it. Let's get it on. And miracles happen. Don't put God in a box. Don't ever put God in a box. Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt, but now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianite. Instead of reflecting on their own shortcomings they're blaming god how many times have we seen that happen and the lord looked at him and said go in this your might you will save israel from the hand of midian have i not sent you go just just go mighty man of valor just quit quit arguing and go and he said to him, Oh, my Lord, what will I save Israel? My family is poor in Manasseh, and I'm the least in my father's house. How many of you have looked at a situation and said, I don't know how I'm going to get it done. I'm, I'm, I'm a poor old bugger, and I'm nobody special. Gideon's saying, I'm a poor, lonely kid, and I'm the runt of the litter, and you expect me to do what? How many of us have been there? I got it. And the Lord said to him, surely I shall be with you, and you will strike Midian as one man. And, wait a minute. Did we not read at the beginning that Midian and the Amalekites and all the rest of them came in as grasshoppers, more like locusts. They were a swarm that came in. And you tell me I'm going to I'm going to smite them like they're one dude. And he said to him, "If now I have found favor in your sight, then show me a sign that you're talking with me." Now, please do not leave from here until I come and bring you my offering. Now, I've got to, I've got to go back here. Let's see. Can we go back? Has delivered us from the... Da, da, da. I'm trying to find the point here. But you have not obeyed my voice. 
that is key to this whole whole thing that we're going on here. Do not be in awe of the gods of Amorite whose land you dwell, but you have not obeyed my voice. That's where this whole thing went sideways. As Christians will fight tooth and nail to keep the Ten Commandments on the courthouse steps, in the U.S. anyway, we'll fight and we'll spend all this money for lawyers and we'll fight to keep it. And yet, the same ones that are fighting don't even keep all of them. Don't even keep a portion of them in many cases. How ironic is that? Honor father and mother, and and many times they shuffle shuffle mom and dad off to foster homes that and just leave them there to die. I know sometimes you have to do it, but you could go visit. You can take care of. You can get out there and, and make sure their welfare is taken care of, as they did for you when you came into the world. Honor the Sabbath. Oh, no, no, no. We're, we're taught that Sunday. We don't have to. We, we, we don't have to do that anymore because now we have a Sunday Sabbath. Well, I know I'm standing on toes right now. I'm going to stay there for a little bit. This is all about making choices, and the only choice we have is to obey or disobey. Remember, Yeshua in Matthew 5, 517 said it best, I am not come to destroy the law and the prophets, but to fulfill it. He didn't do away with any of it. He come to ratify a a more advantageous covenant, not a new covenant. It was an amendment to the old covenant that was still in place, the original draft, with an amendment now making it easier for us to keep our end of the deal. Didn't change a thing of what God said he was going to do. Now, let's go on here. Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. Okay, so so Gideon told the angel, hey, I'm just a poor little kid, but okay, tell you what. Now let me please bring something. He had to get away and think is what he was doing. And it was the culture. Be hospitable, right? And the angel said, I'm, I am staying until you come again. And Gideon went in and made ready a kid and unleavened cakes of a, ephod of flour, he put the flesh in a basket, and he put the broth in a pot, and brought it out to him under the oak, and presented it. Now, you got to understand, this was hours. I mean, it took hours. They had to catch the kid, and and dress it, and prepare it, and, and then, wow, this is like all afternoon deal, right? And then look at here, the angel of God said to him, take the flesh and the unleavened cakes and lay them upon this rock and pour out the broth. And he did so. Then the angel of the Lord put forth the end of the staff that was in his hand and touched the flesh and the unleavened cakes. And there rose up a fire out of the rock and consumed the flesh and the unleavened cakes and the angel of the Lord departed. Don't you just talk about making an entrance. He come in, sit down under an oak tree, but his exit was something else. Make fire come up out of the earth and consume everything. And then poof, he's gone. You would think after that show, after that miracle, and I've seen this over and over again. Somebody receives a bona fide miracle. They are healed. And then what happens? And when Gideon perceived that he was an angel, oh, you think it took that much? He couldn't get it with the first little bit that he was, the angel was talking to him. He had no eyes to see. 
And Gideon said, Alas, my lord, because I've seen an angel of the Lord face to face. He thought he was dead meat. He thought, okay, I'm done. And the Lord said to him, Peace be with you. Do not be in awe. Don't be afraid. You're not going to die. Then Gideon built an altar there to the Lord and called it the Lord Shalom. The Lord Shalom. Peace. And the Spirit comes in Gideon and he walks in faith and doubt. He walks in faith and doubt. Then all of Midian and, and Amalek and the children of the east were gathered together and went over and pitched in the valley of Jezreel. Where have we heard about that again? And that's going to come up time and time again. But the Spirit, remember at the beginning I said this is going to play out again and again. But the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon and he blew the shofar and Abazir was gathered after him, and he sent messengers throughout all Manasseh, who also gathered after him, and he sent messengers to Asher and Zebulun and Neptali, and they all came up to meet him. And Gideon said to God, If you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said. And then he wanted to throw out a fleece. That's where we get the term laying out a fleece. He didn't need a fleece. I would say in a lot of cases, too many people get fleeced by fleeces because the enemy, darkness, hears what's going on and has a real good way of manipulating that whole process from time to time. I'm not saying that you have, if you have done it and been successful with it, go ahead. But bear in mind that this is the only occasion, correct me if I'm wrong, this is the only occasion that we see somebody doing this. I know they used to in the temple cast lots and do things like that, and, and the Lord would do different things. But really, brothers and sisters, if we know and we walk by faith, not by sight, then, then do we really need a fleece? Do we need to really question if we know that we know? Here in this case, Gideon perceived that he had an angelic vegetation. Wow. Many of us don't get near even that. We've got to walk by faith, period. But we have the word of God. And when we learn how to operate in that power with the Ruach, the Spirit, do we really need a outward sign? Just saying, just something to think about. And the army shrinks. And here's where it gets fun. And there's a real interesting point that I never considered in this whole process. And the Lord said to Gideon, the people who are with you are too many for me to give Midian into their hands, lest Israel take credit for themselves instead of me saying, my own hand saved me. Getting back to the title of this message, that God will use adversity. We go back to Deuteronomy 8. What does it tell us there? Deuteronomy 8, Deuteronomy 6. One of those two, look it up. I'm getting it jumbled up. This is why I've taken you through the wilderness these 40 years to prove you, to humble you, to know what's in your heart. God does it time and time again. Don't despise the wilderness. Don't despise the wilderness or the things that you're walking through because they 
are the testing ground to prove that you are able to go on to new heights, to go on and fulfill the things that the Lord God has put into your heart. Praise him for getting you through the valley. Praise him for the victory in the fight. God has to get us to a point where we give him all the credit. He is a jealous God, and he doesn't want anybody else taking credit for what he does. Verse 3, Now therefore go proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead. You can't go on to victory when you have naysayers in your camp or in your house. There are times we best just keep our vision close to our chest and only share it with those who you know will support you and pray with you and strengthen you. Don't tell it to people that you know are going to find a way to tell you you're wrong. We've had mothers, brothers, fathers, teachers, sisters, cousins, church members, co-workers that have all tried to steal. And why? Because they are jealous or too unafraid or just too damn lazy to get up and make it happen for themselves. And they don't want to see you succeed because that would just show their own failure. Yeah, there I go again, standing on toes. Don't shout me down when I'm preaching good. Don't waste your time. Don't cast your pearls before the swine. This is what was happening here. Didn't Yeshua do the same thing when he went in to heal the one little girl? They said, oh, master, she's already dead. All right, clear the room. Get everybody out. These, these crying women, get rid of them. I only want a couple of people. You, you, and you, come with me. That's it. Boom. He had to get rid of the fear, the doubt. So do we. And 22,000 of the people returned and 10,000 remained. Two-thirds of those people were walking in, thir in fear because they, they were walking by sight and not by faith. They didn't have the vision all they could see was the multitude of grasshoppers, locusts, Midianites, Malachites, all the rest of these ites. And they've been beat down for how many years? They said, we can't win. Just like the spies that went into the promised land and said, we're like grasshoppers. Now, nobody said that. That's what they said to themselves except for Joshua and Caleb. Love those guys. So we got rid of two-thirds. Now we need another downsizing. And the Lord said to get in. The people are still too many. Bring them down to the water, and I shall try them for you there. And it will be of whom I say to you, this will go with you, and the same will go with you. And of whoever I say to you, this will not go with you, the same will not go. So he brought the people down to the water. And the Lord said to Gideon, everyone who laps the water with his tongue like a dog laps, you will set him by himself. Likewise, everyone who bows down upon his knees to drink. And the number of those who lapped, putting their and the number of those who lapped putting their hand to their mouth were 300 men, but all the rest of the people bowed down on their knees to drink. 
what in the world is going on? Why does it matter how in the world they get a drink? Well, there's a type and shadow being done here. If you look, the people that have their head down, you ever watch those those reels, those nature things where the wildebeest or the the zebra or whatever goes down to the water and they stick their head in to get a drink and all of a sudden an alligator comes up and snatches them in and they're done. Well, that's kind of what's going on. But here's the other thing that I never considered. Do you think, when you think back of the sacrifices, the sacrificial system, the Lord God wants this raised up. He doesn't want man to bow down like every other animal. There was a type and shadow that we were made just a little lower than the angels. We're not animals. We should act like it. And those men who would reach down and cup their hand and bring it as an offering, kind of like that offering we do the water libation, or used to, and and that steam and everything comes up, and the vapor and the smoke from the offering comes up. Everything comes up to God. Here's a type and shadow, and I never considered it, but I, I kind of wonder if that isn't exactly what's going on. The Father wants his warriors to be alert. Because if your head's down drinking, you're not paying attention to what's going on around you. And the other thing is that you are made in the image of God, bringing everything up to his presence. Just something that struck me this week as I looked at this. So we cut it down to 300. Now consider this. When we go through all of that, And, and we get down to the point where we've got our armor, we've got our inner core. You know, I heard this this week. Yeshua doesn't see your illness. He knows your wellness. And that's pretty powerful. When you consider it, if you want to take a screenshot or write this down, do it. God doesn't see your blank. Put in your limitation. He doesn't see your age. He doesn't see your strength. He doesn't see your financial stability. He doesn't instability. He doesn't see your sickness. He sees you as he created you from the foundations of the universe to fulfill a calling in your life. Mighty man, mighty woman of valor. If God sees you that way, and I know you're that way because you know why? You were made in the image of God just as I am, just as Yeshua was. And his image is not second class. His image is not poor, is not sick, is not what? How do you see yourself? If Yeshua, if the Father doesn't see you with illness, let me give you a, an example here. For some of you know this and some of you don't. When I pray, the gift that's been given to me is that I get kind of this, remember the old Superman thing where he sees through with his x-ray vision? He can see the heart pumping. He can, I got something kind of like that going on. But you know the secret? I don't see the diseased heart. I don't see the cancer. 
I don't see whatever ailment, the bad joint, the, the deterioration. I see the perfection. I see the way God sees, the way he made it. And then I pray into it and I release that image of you whole, of you well, of you prosperous, living in abundance, above and not beneath, the head and not the tail. You're blessed coming in and blessed going out. When I pray, that's what I see. And that's also why miracles happen. This is why and how and what keeps a lot of us. Oh, I'm just a poor kid and I'm the runt of the litter in my house in one of the least tribes of Israel. And I come from a poor country. Is that the way God sees you, really? Think about it. That conversation could have went two ways with Gideon. Gideon, I know you're kind of a runt. And David, you're kind of ruddy. But guess what? Uh, I think if we send you to some training and, and we try to get you on a special diet and get you pumped up, I think God can I think God can turn this around and, and, and make something out of you. Doesn't say that, does he? The good news is God will take you where you are right now because he already sees you the way he made you, not the way you are right now. Amen. I just want to, and I kind of kept on this picture so that you can get this burned into your memory. Burn this into your spirit. God doesn't see you the way you are right now. You know, the, and I've done this for a while. I'm walking down, I'm going to work, and, and especially if I'm doing something that's not too pleasant. And there are some jobs on the farm that get that way, right? You know what, as I'm going down saying, these guys have no idea who they're working with. They have no idea their time of visitation was somebody special from the Father. They're walking and working with a millionaire, a multi-millionaire. Talk about an attitude. Is that... Is that conceit? Is that pride? Is that who you think you are? Or is that being convinced of how the Father sees you? Because let me tell you, you'll only get as far as you see. The Father's already got a vision, vision of you, and it's not broke, sick, old, nasty, grumpy, broke down, that ain't him. You're a child of the king. The king. Big K. We got to remember to start acting like it. Especially when we boom, take another hit. Praise you, Father. What am I learning out of this? Amen? Amen. Let's close. I'm going to Escape, stop, share, boom. I gave you enough time on that. Father, I thank you. I thank you and praise you for all the good that you poured out. I praise you that you see us differently than we see ourselves. Father, in the name of Yeshua, I come against every lie, every image that has been thrown at my brothers and sisters, your children. Every image that darkness has had to hold them down. I break it in the name of Yeshua. 
I release them from that curse. Father, open their eyes that they may get a vision of who they truly are and how you truly see them. Father, I thank you for it. I praise you. I praise you for the encouragement, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. I thank you. Be with us. Send your peace. Send your power. Heal and restore. Father, right now, send this anointing that I can feel out to your people and heal them, everyone, in Yeshua's name. Folks, reach out and grab it. If you need it, it's there. Reach out and grab it. That's all I'm going to say. <clears throat> you got something going on. I heard some great things. What was it, last week when I said this congestive heart thing? Prayed for some. I didn't know what's going on. I got a text. I mean, I... I don't think I even got a sip of water in and the phone started dinging. Somebody was doing a dance because they knew somebody was getting a miracle. I look forward to them. I expect them. It's not bad to expect. It's not bad to, to ask God to prove. Amen? Amen. Mighty men and women of valor, shalom. Go in power. For the Lord God has delivered your enemies to you. Amen? Amen.